this time I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, spring 2015 honors lecture series on Native American culture. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Philip Phillips and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College and uh, Dean John Vile and I welcome you here today. Our audience is comprised mainly of students, but uh, in addition to this being a, uh, a class, this is a lecture series that is free and open to the public. So those of you who are visiting today, uh, welcome. We're really glad to have you here. I want to say a word about this poster uh, on, Native, uh, on the lecture series. Um, our lecture series poster was designed by our own, very own, uh, Susan Lyons, and it features an example of ledger art, in case you were wondering. Uh, ledger art is a genre that represents a transitional form of Plains Indian artistry that corresponds to the forced reduction of the Plains tribes to government reservations. Because of the destruction of the buffalo herds and other game animals um, by the Anglo-Americans during the Civil War and after, um, painted on buffalo painted on buffalo hide gave way to works that were uh, painted on paper, muslin, canvas, and occasionally commercially prepared cow or buffalo hides. Beginning in the early 1860s, the Plains Indians artists adapted their style of painting uh, to paper in the form of accountant's ledger books. So if you're wondering what the lines were behind the art, traditional paints and bone and stick brushes used to paint on hide were replaced by new implements such as colored pencils, crayon, and occasionally watercolor paints. The Plains artists acquired paper and new drawing materials in trade in, and uh, booty after a military engagement or from a raid, a raid. Initially, the content of ledger drawings continued the tradition of depicting military exploits and important acts of personal heroism. As the U.S. government implemented the forced relocation of the Plains people to reservations, uh, mostly in the 1870s, Plains artists added scenes of ceremony and daily life from before the reservation to the repertoire of their artwork, reflecting the social and cultural changes brought by life on the reservation within the larger context of forced assimilation. And for those of you who are interested in learning more about this uh, unique and beautiful uh, form of art, I would encourage you to visit the website entitled plainsledgerart.org, all one word for more information. The beautiful uh, piece of art that is featured on our poster is an original work of art by Donald F. Montalo an artist born in Pine Ridge and now living in Rapid City, South Dakota. His two great-grandmothers were Lakota and his two great-grandfathers were French from Quebec. Mr. Montalo very generously donated this particular image to us for our use and we're very grateful to him. Uh, if you want to know more about the artist, I would encourage you to visit www donaldfmontelo.com. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Kevin Smith is professor of sociology and anthropology and faculty advisor for the interdisciplinary minor in Native American studies here at Middle Tennessee State University. Dr. Smith has also served as advisor for the Native American Student Association Native American Heritage Society, and the MTSU American Indian Festival in Pow Wow. His research spans over 12,000 years of Native American history, including archaeology, ethno-history, and contemporary life. He teaches a variety of undergraduate courses, including peoples and cultures of Native North America, Native Americans in popular speculative fiction, and Native American folklore. He's currently collaborating on Ancestors, Native American Stone Statuary of Tennessee, the first major exhibition of prehistoric Native American stone sculpture
plan to open at the Tennessee State Museum. Dr. Smith's keynote presentation today is titled, Gifts from the People, the Cultural Legacy of Native American. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Smith. Good afternoon. Chilly afternoon, but good anyway. Those of you familiar with my teaching and research might have been tempted to speculate on what I might approach in today's presentation. You might have anticipated something on the stereotypes of Native peoples that confront us in so many venues, a popular subject of mine. Or maybe you anticipated something on the extraordinary 13,000 plus years of Native American prehistory in the Western Hemisphere is evidenced through archaeology, folklore, and oral tradition. I do hate being predictable, though, so let's ponder a few different kinds of questions today. Questions that involve the global impacts of Native culture, the hidden legacy of Native cultures in our language and history, and a few high points to the accomplishments of Native peoples in occupations and arenas not typically thought of. So I'll just run through these quickly. What do Native peoples have to do with ravioli, goulash, and succotash? What would be left on your dessert tray without Native peoples? Do you speak some Native American on a daily basis? What do Native peoples have to do with the centennial of the Great War? World War I. What does the Great Comet and the New Madrid earthquakes of 1811 to 1812 have to do with Native peoples? How did Native peoples contribute to the Irish diaspora? How many U.S. stamps bear Native images? And of what? And finally, are there really doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs, and ballerinas, and astronauts, and authors? So I'm going to be jumping around a bit, but hopefully by the time I get finished, these will be woven together in a way that make a little bit of sense anyway. First, let's take a quick glance. I borrow from uh, the anthropologist Jack Weatherford for the first part of this a little bit. Dr. Weatherford's also a distant descendant of one of the Creek chiefs that I'll be bringing up a little bit later, William Weatherford. So let's look at the national cuisines of Europe, none of which could exist without the introduction of hundreds of plants domesticated by Native Americans. And for now, I'm going to use the term broadly to refer to all the peoples of the Western Hemisphere, all the Native peoples. So North America, Middle America, and South America. Virtually all the varieties of beans commonly eaten today came from the Americas, as did all the sweet and hot peppers as did all the potatoes, including sweet potatoes. Most of the world's squashes, including pumpkins, peanuts and cashews, and the absolutely essential tomato. Just as one example, what would Italian national cuisine be without tomatoes, zucchinis, and the host of sweet peppers? A pile of pasta, with a little garlic and onions on the side. The rest of it is a contribution of native farmers. British cuisine, although not as internationally recognized as some others, would be hard to imagine without the Native American potato crust of shepherd's pie and the steak fries of fish and chips. Closer to home, what would southern cuisine be without maize, a native domesticate that did not penetrate European cuisine as thoroughly as some others, but certainly became the mainstay of tables in the South? And regardless of debates over the reality and romanticism of the pilgrim origins of Thanksgiving, it's hard to envision it without turkey, cranberry sauce, and sweet potatoes, all of which, of course, are native foods. For those who like to snack, Without potatoes and maize, we'd be short on the potato chips, corn chips, nachos, popcorn, and those so-called french fries. 
And without avocados, chiles, and tomatoes, salsa and guacamole dips would be a bit bland. And I hope you already ate. <laughs> For dessert lovers, the centerpieces of American contributions have to be chocolate and vanilla. But we'd also lose pecan pie, sweet potato pie, pumpkin pie, and where would Cracker Jack be without popped corn coated with maple syrup? Drill mix would also be a bit on the short side. No sunflower seeds either. Although global estimates are always subject to debate, many have argued that approximately three-fifths of the world's basic food supply today is supplied by plants that were originally domesticated by native peoples. Medical treatments were also different and more advanced in some ways in the New World. Medicine in most parts of the world at that time had not yet risen far above witchcraft and alchemy. In the Old World, physicians talked about balancing body humors as they attached leeches to their patients and burned them with hot coals. By contrast, the Indians of America had refined a complex set of active drugs that became the basis for much of modern medicine and pharmacology. The Indians of California and Oregon used the bark of the Ramnus persianus rub as a cure for constipation. It's been the world's most commonly used laxative since its first introduction by the American pharmaceutical industry in 1878. Amazonian Indians discovered curare, a muscle relaxant, which was the first treatment for tetanus, or lockjaw. In due time, it was synthesized into a number of different muscle relaxant drugs. Bark of the willow tree, shown on the upper right here, used to treat minor pain. Active ingredient is salicylin, which closely resembles what we call aspirin. One of the most widely used skin ointments in the world today, petroleum jelly. Indians were the first to apply it to human and animal skin to protect wounds, stimulate healing, and keep the skin moist. Indian surgeons healed facial lacerations with bone needles threaded with human hair. They set bones and plasters made of downy feathers, gum, resin, and rubber. They gave enemas with rubber hoses, and they invented the bulb syringe. European doctors quickly adopted the rubber hose and rubber syringe and continue to use them today. Indian healers, Lance Boyles, removed tumors. Surgeons amputated limbs successfully, prescribed artificial legs, removed teeth and castrated men and animals. Bathing and steam baths were found throughout the Americas. The extensive use of bath by Indians was viewed with distrust by the Spaniards, who thought that frequent bathing was debilitating to the body and could lead to horrible diseases. The widespread and persistent use of steam baths and water baths by the Indians paralleled the practices of Mediterranean cultures but stood in sharp contrast to those of the Northern Europeans. We shouldn't leave out soda. The soft drink industry grew directly out of the traveling medicinal salesmen who hawked various kinds of Indian tonics, snake oils. As American medicine became established and regulated by universities, hospitals, and medical associations, Indian healers were pushed ever farther aside. The medicine show became vaudeville, and Indian medicine became associated with shams and quackery. The Indian cures and medicines circled the world and became fully integrated into cultures on every continent. The medicines are so taken for granted today that it's easy to forget that they had not been discovered or invented by old world doctors, pharmacists, and chemists. In another arena, you might think you don't know any native languages. There are thousands and thousands of native words in English today, but I'll restrict myself to just some examples from primarily Eastern Algonquian languages. Words from this language family are very common additions to English because many of the native peoples of the Eastern seaboard where the first colonies were located spoke those languages. Our common names for most of the native animals of the Eastern woodlands come from Algonquian languages, skunks, terrapins, raccoons, opossums, chipmunks, and the moose. Many of our names for native eastern plants as well, persimmons, 
squash, maypop, and hickory, which may seem a bit ironic a bit later that Andrew Jackson would be nicknamed Old Hickory after a native word. Over half the names of states are known or believed to come from indigenous languages, including nine from Algonquian languages. While scholars continue to debate some of these, like California, which I don't include on my list, but this map does, or Arkansas, which I do include on my list, but this map doesn't. Most of the earliest states on the eastern seaboard are named for important Europeans, like the Royal Charles and George and Virginia, or the more local William Penn. But as the United States was created and expanded westward, the names were increasingly drawn from native terms. I could go on for a lot longer if we included the names of rivers and lakes and other things, but I won't. So let's just say all of us probably speak quite a bit more Native American than we might think. Well, since I somehow managed to segue from food to language, let's do a broad jump to postage stamps for a second. Since the beginning, postage stamps have been used in the United States and elsewhere in a commemorative way. The images on them commemorate things. Depending on how you count them, Native Americans or related themes have been commemorated on over 70 such stamps since 1875. Those include ones celebrating ancient Native American sites like Mesa Verde on the upper left here. Mesa Verde was the first major prehistoric Native American site purchased by the U.S. government and turned into a national park, even before the national park system was formalized. We also have a multitude of famous Indian chiefs and a princess or two, some Native peoples famous for other things, like Will Rogers on the center left, Jim Thorpe on the upper left, and a multitude of stamp series devoted to Native arts and culture, most of those shown here on the, on the right side. Commemoration will be a part or a theme that runs throughout the rest of my discussion today. With the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian on the Mall in Washington, D.C., a little over 10 years ago, the U.S. Postal Service issued a 10-stamp panel. Out of the millions of objects they could have selected, one was one of the finest pieces of Native American stone sculpture ever found north of Mexico, circled here in red. It came from just a few miles away from where we're sitting at the Sellers Mound site near Lebanon, Tennessee, now a state archaeological park. We officially celebrated that stamp twice in Tennessee in 2004, once at the McClung Museum at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where it's resided for over 50 years since it was discovered, and once at the Sellers Mound site itself, where it was manufactured some 800 years ago. Less than a year ago, that statue became Tennessee's first official state artifact when Governor Haslam signed that bill into law in March. Tennessee is now one of the handful of states to recognize prehistoric Native America with a state artifact. And that statue will be among the over 30 such masterpieces in the exhibit I'm co-curating at the Tennessee State Museum opening this October, mentioned in the introduction. Americans also have their favorite wars to commemorate. I'm not a big fan of wars, but I am a fan of recognizing the contributions of the young men and women who agree to serve their country. And it's very rare for there to be an, a major Native American event where they fail to recognize their soldiers, uh, their veterans, and, and their honored war dead. Right now, we're entering the last few months of the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War. Not too long ago, celebrations of the 50th anniversary of World War II took place. The Navajo Code Talkers, two of which are shown here, got quite a bit of positive press as a result. Their use of their native tongue as a code on the battlefront captured popular imagination. 
we were reminded again of them when Chester Nez, the last of the original 29 Navajo Code Talkers, passed away in November 2014. One might wonder why they were used in the Pacific Theater more than in the European one in World War II. Hitler had sent a host of linguists to the United States prior to the beginning of World War II to study native languages, as if in anticipation of the use of codes. Uh, why would he think of such a thing? Well, because the first tremendous use of native code talkers was during the preceding Great War, World War I. The first documented use were Cherokee code talkers, although I believe that they were attached to a British unit at the time. It also includes the large contingent of 19 Choctaw code talkers shown in the middle here, commemorated at the uh, Choctaw War Memorial shown on the upper right. And Siouan speakers, like those mentioned in the article from Stars and Stripes, January 1919 on the right. We're in the midst of the centennial of that war, but it hasn't gotten much traction in the United States yet. Although the war started for Europe in mid-1914, the United States would not officially enter the war until early 1917. And since many of the records for military records for World War I were lost in a fire, it's hard to tell exactly how many Native Americans served in the war, but most would say somewhere between 13 and 14,000 volunteered. It might be even more surprising that almost none of them were United States citizens at the time. Native Americans were not granted citizenship until the Indian Citizenship Act 1924, and that prompted in large part by their amazing turnout to volunteer for a country that had placed them on reservations only three decades earlier. The World War I Tours American Monument in France commemorates the 650,000 United States citizens who served in the Services of Supply, or SOS, for the American Expeditionary Force. They were headquarters in Tours, France. This monument to them, topping it, is an enormous bronze sculpture. The topic was selected as a Native American releasing an eagle. We're also at the very end of the bicentennial of another war that didn't get much traction in the, for commemoration in the United States, the War of 1812. Not satisfied with the outcome of the American Revolutionary War, Britain the fledgling United States, and many native peoples returned to war from 1812 to 1815. The Treaty of Ghent, ending that war, was ratified by the US Congress 200 years ago this week. The British were aided greatly by the efforts of the great Shawnee leader, Tecumseh, shown here on the left. Celestial Owen, his brother, Tenskwatawa, shown on the right, a native religious leader, known as the Prophet. So the British were aided greatly by these two. Celestial Panther, a rough translation of his name, organized one of the largest native confederacies in history in alliance with the British against the United States. Perhaps named after a comet that was in the sky at the time of his birth, Tecumthus certainly drew upon the great comet of 1811 to 1812 as an omen in support of his mission to unite all native peoples against the United States. And the New Madrid earthquakes of 1811 to 1812 as he campaigned in the South also brought many native peoples to his cause. Although an enemy of the United States, Tecumthe has received some admiration and recognition this side of the Canadian border. On the other side, he's revered as a Canadian national hero, given credit for keeping the United States from invading Canada. Tecumthe's influence was far-reaching, even to the Creek Confederacy in the American South. The Red Stick faction of the Creeks allied themselves with Tecumseh's cause, 
in the Red Stick War of 1813 to 1814, a Creek Civil War that split the nation between the American and British sides in the War of 1812. The then only slightly known Andrew Jackson was to make his national mark with the defeat of La Mochate and the other Creek chiefs at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in Alabama, although the debate still goes on whether it should be better called a massacre. From there, the new hero proceed to make his national mark during the decisive battle of New Orleans, the 200th anniversary of which passed just less than a month ago. If we slip forward in time a bit, the defeat of the Red Sticks would lead many of their survivors to flee to Spanish Florida, where they joined with the Seminoles. Here we might take an aside to talk about the great leader Osceola, or the fact that the Florida State Seminoles is one of the only native sports team mascots actually approved by an Indian tribe. But I don't have enough time for that many asides, so we'll move on. The other devastating outcome of Jackson's elevation to national hero was his eventual election as president, during which term he forced through the Indian Removal Act that culminated in the Trail of Tears. We have just passed the 175th anniversary of that historical event. And MTSU faculty, staff, students, and partners have been active in documenting and commemorating it in recent weeks, months, and years. One route of that trail passed along the south side of this campus. Other parts have been identified at Old Jefferson and Smyrna. Recently, the last surviving abutments of the 1823 Toll Bridge in Nashville were relocated by members of the Native History Association, <coughs> former students. It's now part of the National Trail of Tears. This was the bridge over which some of the contingents of Cherokee passed before the bridge was demolished in the 1850s. What about the Irish diaspora. Before American potatoes traveled to Europe, from the South America admittedly, but Irish peasants had a diet pretty comparable to that of the poorest countries today. There were over 3,000 types of potatoes raised in South America in the Andes. Only a handful of them made it to Europe, where it provided a new kind of root crop that allowed the population's nutrition to improve and the population to expand by leaps and bounds. Unfortunately or not, they also began exporting millions of tons of guano, bird poop, which on some of the islands off the South American coast were as much as 150 feet thick. It was a perfect fertilizer. desperately needed for the exhausted British soils and Irish soils as well. Those ships full of guano are almost certainly the source of the potato blight that caused the Irish potato famines and drove the deaths and immigration of millions of Irish peasants in the mid-1800s. In a sense, the global encounter came full circle. The influx of Irish immigrants into the United States helped drive the demand for more North American land. Well, enough of that kind of history. There's an American version of an old English counting game, nursery rhyme, fortune telling song, usually used in tag to select it in America. But it reads, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. Those categories are not as mutually exclusive as the rhyme suggests. And I want to spend the rest of my time with a look at a few of the faces of Native America. Oyesa, better remembered as Charles Eastman, was not to my knowledge an Indian chief, although he did dress as one here. He was, however, on occasion, both a doctor and a lawyer for his people, the Santee Dakota. Among other things, he founded 32 Indian YMCA's, 
including one where I worked during the 1980s in South Dakota. At that time, celebrating its 100th anniversary. Native women have also featured prominently in Native American civil rights movements, including Tokmitane, the Paiute activist daughter of Chief Winamuka, who's generally acknowledged as the first Native woman to write an autobiographical account that was published in English. So we can add author, authors to our list of occupations for Indians. Sports heroes, we've already seen White the Hook, a little earlier today, Jim Thorpe, who became one of America's greatest sports heroes before he was a citizen. Just happened to be Native American as well. On the left here, he's in his Carlisle Indian School football uniform in the early 1900s. On the right, at the uh, Olympic Games in 1912, just before the beginning of World War I. There are others, though. Makata Takahela, or Billy Mills, still alive today, remains the only person in the Western Hemisphere to win the gold in the 10,000-meter run. Former Marine, he brought home that unexpected gold from Tokyo the year I was born. Several medical centers and hospitals in Nebraska commemorate the early accomplishments of Dr. Susan LaFleche Picotte an Omaha woman generally recognized as the first Native American woman doctor. So we do have doctors, and her father was a chief. Tribally enrolled Native Americans have also served as elected officials in the United States government, such as Ben Rifle, first Lakota elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served 10 years from 1961 to 1971, or Charles Curtis, an enrolled member of the Kaw tribe, formerly known as the Kansas tribe, after which Kansas and Arkansas are named. He would serve first in the United States Senate and then go on to serve as Herbert Hoover's vice president. More recently, Ben Nighthorse Campbell, a Cheyenne, became the next native senator after Curtis, after 60 years. In Oklahoma, well, my man killer became the first modern woman to serve as principal chief of the Cherokee Nation for her activism in the women's right, rights movement. President Clinton awarded her a Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1998. She did also, however, take time to write a bunch of books on many subjects, including a traditional Cherokee cookbook. Well, I suppose it might seem stereotypical to include a modern Indian who was great with the bow and arrow. Joe Thornton is one of the world's greatest archers. Three world records when he won the 1961 World Archery Championship in Norway. His wife, Helen, was also a champion archer and has her own set of medals. I probably don't need to say much about Will Rogers, born a Cherokee in Oklahoma. But let's do take a moment to think about his son, Will Jr., who served part of one term in the U.S. House of Representatives before returning to service in the U.S. Army, along with one other representative. Rogers sponsored a resolution in the House urging President Roosevelt to create a commission to rescue European Jews. Pressure from that and the corresponding Senate resolution led Roosevelt to reluctantly create the War Refugee Board. Here at home in Tennessee, the Cherokee Sequoia, or Squealy, is remembered for creation of the Cherokee syllabary, one of the earliest documented examples of the creation of a written form of a Native American language. He was unable to read or write any language when he created this. He watched the English writers, what they were able to do with the talking leaves, and managed to write up his own version. This is a syllabary 
So each symbol stands for a syllable rather than for a sound. That works for Cherokee, where the syllables are fairly regular. Syllabaries don't work for English, but because they stood for syllables, if you learned the name of the symbol, you could almost immediately read. So by memorizing the names of 80 plus symbols, the Cherokee went from 0% literacy in their own language to nearly 100% literacy in about 10 years. And in the center there is uh, a copy of the Cherokee Phoenix, which was the Cherokee National Newspaper. And you probably cannot see it, but it's printed in both English and Cherokee uh, because some of their speakers by that point spoke only English. Sequoia's commemoration is broad ranging everywhere from a statue at the nation's capital shown there in the center, lower center, to a frieze at the Library of Congress to the Cherokees' commemoration of him themselves at the Cultural Center in North Carolina. And of course, the great redwoods, California, were named for Sequoia. That's the alternate name for them. A nuclear submarine was named in his honor. Not sure about that one, but we'll let it slide. And Oklahoma was almost named Sequoia that was the name originally proposed when the Indian Territory was to be converted to a state. But he was a Cherokee, and there were a lot of enemies of the Cherokee in Oklahoma, too, so that met with some opposition. So we got a creek name instead, Oklahoma. Sequoia syllabary may have been even more influential than that. It's recently been suggested that its success may have influenced creation of the Vi syllabary in Liberia, Africa. The Cherokee Austin Curtis immigrated there, married into a powerful Vi family, and became a Vi chief himself, all before the creation of the Vi syllabary in 1832 to 1833. So that argument's still going on, but I think there's a good chance that the notion of how successful the Cherokee syllabary was influenced the adoption of the syllabary in Liberia. So now we can add a linguist to our list of native occupations as well. In another area entirely, Maria Tallchief, an enrolled Osage woman, would become America's first major prima ballerina dominating the New York City Ballet for decades and only recently passed away. More recently, Naomi Lang, a member of the Karak tribe of California, became the first Native American female to participate in the Winter Olympics as an ice dancer, following more or less in the footsteps of Maria Tallchief. And finally, to enter the 21st century, let's add astronaut to our list as well. 2002, John Bennett Harrington, an enrolled Chickasaw, became the first Native American to orbit the Earth on the 16th shuttle mission to the International Space Station. That's him doing a spacewalk on the lower left. So, doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs, and a great deal more. There are thousands more examples that we could look at, but I think I've made my point. We should break off America's romance with the stereotype of the vanishing Indian. Focus instead on the central contributions of Native North American peoples and cultures in local, national, and global history and recognize the diversity of talents and accomplishments of all of these individuals who also just happen to be Native American. Thank you. Thank you very much.
very much for your talk. We, we have time remaining, so uh, if you have questions for a speaker, please ask. How do you feel about the state of like the Native American culture now? And do you think that the government has any, um, do you think that it's necessary for the government to step in to kind of help the Native American people out because of what was done in the past? Like what do you see when you think of the, the Native Americans that are still living on the, on the territories and there's so much alcohol that's in the property and stuff like that? Well, I've worked on many reservations. And I've worked with Native people from lots of reservations and from the city and back and forth. So it's a complex question. But I think the simplest answer for federally recognized tribes is if they are sovereign governments and they decide what they will do and what they will accept. Um, some of them did not accept citizenship when, in 1924. They didn't really have a choice, but they formally opposed it because they didn't want it. They were already citizens. And that's really how they feel about it. Um, there are many problems, but the improvements over the last 20 years have been enormous. Um, for many of the reservations, the fact that non-Indians like to gamble and the passage of uh, allowing casino gambling on reservations has increased the amount of income for lots and lots of tribes. The reservation that I worked on in the 80s was one of the, well, it's right in the center of the 15 poorest counties in the United States. And conditions were horrible. There was government housing, families that I stayed with. Um, Red Scaffold, South Dakota. They were built by HUD. They had bathrooms, sinks, but no running water. So you still had to use outhouses. So there was not any, any way to run water out to that remote part of the reservation. But now they have income from other sources. The internet has also been a great help to a lot. As horrible as it is, I get phone calls, telemarketing phone calls from the reservation that I worked on all the time because they have a telemarketing center there. Um, they tried for years to get industry to come out there, but it's simply too far. There's not really an airport anywhere in South Dakota. I mean, you got the one in Pierre, but it's not a major airport. It's uh, 150 miles on bad roads to the, to the reservation, so they couldn't pay enough to get factories to relocate there. But they did manage to pay to put up cell towers and distribution lines so that they are able to employ some of their citizens doing that horrible thing, pestering me at home, <laughs> trying to sell me stuff. But, I mean, that's the kind of innovative approach. The Choctaw and Mississippi are among the most widely respected. All of their casino income is restricted to infrastructure improvements and scholarships for their kids. There have been a number of Choctaw kids that have come from Pearl River to MTSU in the past. Um, We've had a connection with that reservation since the 1970s. And so they've reinvested all that. Uh, the Chickasaw in Oklahoma are doing very well, similarly investing in hotels and basically drawing money out of the outside world. So I, whether, I don't think the United States government should step in. I think they sh they've stepped in enough over the years. What could be done, however, is to actually fund the programs that already exist fully, which has never been done since the late 1800s. Uh, Reagan, during his uh, term terms, gutted the Indian funding 
although it's always been less than 1% of the U.S. government budget. Um, we cut 20% out of that 1%. And that really devastated the tribal college programs, which were, it's really hard for people raised on the reservation sometimes to be successful in the outside world. There's no, like the community that I worked in for several years, only one person had a job out of 300 people. There was no, there weren't any jobs. The only time that there were very many people employed was during roundup time when the local white farmers would hire people to help out. So at that point, you know, unemployment would drop to 60 or 70 percent, which is three, over three times as much as unemployment was during the Great Depression. So that just gives you some idea. It was 75 miles to the nearest gas pump, 75 miles to the nearest store of any kind. There were no stores in Red Scaffold at all. So to get groceries was a 75 mile trip. There was only, there were only three cars in that community usually only one of them was running at a, at a given point in time. So when you're raised in that environment, it's very hard to, to develop a sense of, of time, getting to work on time, showing up, sticking through that, um, going to college. I knew a number of kids there who tried to go to college off the reservation, and they couldn't handle it. I mean, it's stressful enough. There may be some of you out there that are first-generation college students coming in from rural areas to MTSU, and we experience kind of culture shock. I was a second-generation college student from a really poor part of Tennessee when I went to Vanderbilt, and I had tremendous culture shock. It reverberates to this day. <laughs> but. Uh, but imagine coming from a reservation background into a completely different world where almost no one was like you. Uh, no one grew up in a community like you did. So th they were usually not successful. And that was the great success of the tribal college program, which actually paid to put colleges on the reservations. And they had one at Cheyenne River when I was there, finally but it closed after the cuts. It's a tiny expense compared to other things. So that's a long answer to a short question, but I think it's the most important thing to most of the Native people that I know is, is sovereignty, the right to choose whether to stay in those circumstances or not, to make their own decisions about what they want to do. Uh, but other citizens do have the right to encourage their legislators to support those programs. It, it is a treaty obligation, set of treaty obligations that this government made, just like a treaty signed with France or Spain or Britain. Uh, and those obligations continue forever, according to the treaties that we signed. Any other questions? Um, I recently read about the uh, Congress passing the Keystone Pipeline, which, if I understand correctly, will run through the center of the Pine Ridge Reservation. How do you think that that will affect relations between the Lakota people and the U.S. government? There's a lot of anger over the decision to do that, so um, I don't expect that they will sit by quietly. People of Pine Ridge never have. And Sorry, how the reservation shootouts in that two hour race. Well, it is. Uh, in Cheyenne River, when I was there, of course, the, the major violence of the 1970s on Pine Ridge, a lot of people from Pine Ridge fled to Cheyenne River, where I worked. And this was only a little over a decade later, and the memories of that 
were still fresh in a lot of people's minds. The, the killings that took place, the racism, the armored personnel carriers, National Guard, FBI, all of which many of them perceived as, as intrusions, invasions of their homeland by a foreign force. So we'll see where that goes, but it's certainly a poor choice to not consult more fully. Did they have to like ask permission to do that since it was their sovereign territory? Or? Well, sovereign territory when it comes to, it's sovereign until until it has uranium on it or gold or, or we need to put a pipeline through it because it would cost an extra few million dollars to, to root it around the reservation. The lands are, it's a special kind of sovereignty. You know, it's the sovereignty that was the end result of conquest. So the fact that it exists at all is something of a testament to the spirit of the American people in general but it's also, those lands are held in trust by the United States government on behalf of the sovereign governments, so those decisions can still be made. That's why it's really important for the rest of us to watch what happens with those laws, with the legislators, because those are sacred obligations that we owe, and it's really easy for legislators to break that unless we watch very carefully. And that's been the pendulum back and forth over the century plus of uh, Indian treaties and Indian policies by the U.S. government. It swings back and forth between self-determination and assimilation. And that pendulum has swung back and forth five times now. Uh, we've been in a period of self-determination for the last 25 years, pretty well supported, but that pendulum, it's time for it to swing back again. Like the boarding schools, like where our, our buddy Jim Thorpe went, uh, those were forced enrollment boarding schools where, where native children were taken from their homes and their families because the policy then was assimilation. Take them to places many, many, many miles away from their family, uh, punish them with floggings if they spoke their native language, cut their hair, take away their native clothing, if, flog them if they were caught practicing native ceremonies. And many of them did not go home for years I mean, until their schooling was done. And if you look at the cemeteries at many of those schools, many of them never, never got to go home. So that, that's part of the legacy as well. And that's why vigilance on our part, to my mind, is, is critical. I wish we had more time. Thank you. Thank you.